What's the best way to take your herbal medicine? Is it teas, infusions, decoctions, tinctures, cap tablets, capsules, standardized extracts, super concentrates? You know, with so many different products available on the market these days, it's no wonder so many people out there get overwhelmed, confused, and sometimes it can be actually easy to be misled by really big phytopharmaceutical companies whose sole purpose is honestly usually focused more on making profit uh, than it is providing the best, most effective form of herbal extract. So today I wanted to talk about some of the different forms of herbal extract to kind of explain what they are, what their differences are, and when is it appropriate for us to take uh, for a form of herbal extract that may not necessarily be uh, preparable by the, the folk home herbalist or even the clinical herbalist that makes their own medicine? Um, you know, there's certainly lots of products out there that we can't necessarily make in our home kitchen, home pharmacy, or even home lab environment. And, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like that there's this mindset maybe out there in the world, in the culture that, you know, stronger is better. The more concentrated, the better. And is that, is it true? You know, is it necessarily true? Do we really need to be taking 100 to one concentrate herbal extracts of ginseng, right? Uh, so I wanted to, to take a look at what I see as kind of three big picture general categories of herbal extracts and kind of talk about some of their, their similarities, their differences, um, and kind of compare them together so we can get a little bit of a better understanding of the different forms of herbal extract. So the first one I wanna talk about here is what I generally refer to as just a whole plant extract. Um, this is really the type of extract that most of us as herbalists are the most familiar with and the types that we typically use the most, right? These are um, our powdered herbs, uh, whenever we're making a water extraction, that being uh, an infusion or a decoction of the herb, whenever we're making tinctures or infused oils, right? We're basically extracting the whole plant. And, and, and when we're, and especially when we start talking about spagyrics and alchemical preparations, then we're like really getting the whole plant. Um, but what, what, what a whole plant extract essentially is, like the way I like to think of it and define it, is that the preparation, the medicine that you're making is a representation of the chemical composition of that plant as it exists in nature right? That we're just drawing all the chemistry out of the plant into our menstruum, whether it be water or vinegar or oil or alcohol, in the ratios and amounts that is just naturally present within that herb. Um, whereas, you know, so, so in that way, you're getting the broadest spectrum of the, the biochemical profile of that plant. Now, obviously, <clears throat> in order to effectively do that, we generally need to have, at the very least, a rudimentary knowledge of that plant's phytochemistry, right? We gotta have an understanding what chemical compounds are in that herb, what class or category of compound that is, and then what the general solubility range of that type of compound is. So some chemical compounds tend to be more soluble in water, some tend to be more soluble in oil or high proof alcohol, and many tend to kind of fit somewhere in between. And this is why tinctures in, you know, these days and for a long time uh, are just a really common method of preparation for whole plant extracts. <clears throat> you get alcohol soluble constituents, you get water soluble constituents, and the, the extract is well preserved. If you keep your tinctures in a, a, a cool, dark, 
uh, not, you don't just leave them open, you know, you keep it in a sealed bottle. Your tinctures are generally gonna last a pretty long time. Uh, they don't exactly expire or go bad. And this is why tinctures are just a super ideal method of preparation and I think represent uh, a really, are a really good way of preparing a whole plant type of extract. Do they work? Of course they work, right? Uh, whole plant extracts have literally, this is how people have used herbal medicine since the dawn of herbal medicine, and they work, right? Uh, people have been putting medicinal plants in water <laughs> to make infusions and decoctions for a very long time. For not quite as long, but still for a decent amount of time, people have been putting herbs in alcohol to extract and preserve their medicinal virtues. Um, this is just how plant medicine has been done for a very, very long time. And to me, the proof is in the pudding. Whole plant extracts work. And the reason that I think this is true and why, as you'll find, I tend to really prefer whole plant extracts is because we have this principle <clears throat> of constituent synergy, right? Where you have this whole slew of chemical constituents in a plant that all work together to bring about the unique virtues and medicinal properties of that herb. Uh, science really wants to pinpoint the one thing in that herb that is its medicinal property, right? They want to say, okay, what, what is the one thing in there? What's the isolated compound that's responsible for the whole medicinal property of the plant? And it's a really, ultimately, from my perspective, I think the, the question in and of itself is flawed. <laughs> There's a lot of medicinal plants out there that you can't pinpoint their medicinal property to a single isolated constituent. Like the reason the plant or the, the, the thing in the plant that gives it its medicinal property isn't one single thing, it's the whole plant, right? It's the plant is what is bringing that healing property, not some one little constituent that we can pull out and isolate. And this, this concept of constituent synergy is really important in herbal medicine because we recognize that, that the biochemical profile of plants are complex. Our human biochemical nature is very complex. And as soon as we ingest a medicinal plant, there is a whole complicated set of things that happens as those compounds come into contact with enzymes and with the liver metabolism and with circulation and, you know, the constituents are probably interacting with one another and interacting with the body and being transformed. Like there's no way we can really possibly know everything that's going on biochemically. Even when we take a single herb that might have hundreds or thousands of constituents in it. So a really great example of this is curcumin and turmeric. So everybody's been talking about curcumin for a long time. And, you know, that's what science wants to believe is the, you know, the active constituent in turmeric. And essentially by saying that, by saying curcumin is the active constituents in, in turmeric, it's kind of saying that the rest of the constituents in turmeric are not active. Like they're just superfluous. Like they're just there as filler. Like they don't really do anything. It's kind of what's implied by that statement of what the active constituent is. <clears throat> but what we found out and what the research has shown is that curcumin doesn't really work that well. <laughs> like, like when you take just straight curcumin, most of it doesn't even get absorbed. This is why you'll see most curcumin type extracts uh, have the addition of what's called bioperine, which is a black pepper extract that enhances the absorption of curcumin. But when you take whole plant turmeric, right, you just take turmeric powder or you make a golden milk or you take a turmeric tincture, guess what? Curcumin is very well absorbed because there's constituent synergy. Th those other 
non-active constituents, as science would kind of think about them, um, are super important in the way that they interface with our bodies and with the other compounds in the plant to make them bioavailable, to make them usable. So I use turmeric as an example because it's a common plant. A lot of people know about turmeric and know about it being, you know, quote unquote, anti-inflammatory and good for joint pain and all this other stuff. But this is this concept of constituent synergy is present in a lot of medicinal plants, right? Not just in turmeric. So whole plant extracts, this is really what we're using for the most part as herbalists. But of course, in this modern world of a, you know, absolutely massive supplement industry, huge companies making all different types of products with vitamins and minerals and herbs and plants and all this stuff. I wanted to talk about two other types of herb extracts that I think is good to be aware of. So the second is what we would refer to as a standardized extract. Now, the standardized extracts are somewhere in between a whole plant extract, and the next category that I'm gonna talk about, which is what I tend to think of as like phytopharmaceuticals. Um, we can think of them as a whole plant extract, but that has been standardized to uh, a certain percentage of those bioactive constituents. So um, this would be things like Kava kava tinctures being standardized to a certain percent of kava lactones. Ginkgo standardized to the ginkalides. Saw palmetto standardized to um, you know the the sterols that are present in saw palmetto. Ginseng standardized to ginsenicides. Black cohosh <clears throat> standardized triterpene glycosides. Right. These are kind of some examples of herbs that are commonly found as standardized extracts. Why do companies do this? Well, this is because uh, really based on scientific research on the herbs and uh, you know that research showing that these certain constituents have certain medicinal effects at a certain concentration. And so these herb companies are basically spiking their herb extracts with these standardized compounds in order to have a degree of consistency to them. And, you know, I, I, I don't really think that's necessarily a bad thing per se, right? Um, consistency in herbal extracts is really important, right? If you're buying a product from a company for a health concern and you've got to buy it over time, you want to know that from one batch to the next that you're going to be getting, you know, uh, <clears throat> a similar constant, you know, the same concentration, the same quality of product. Um, so, so I think a lot of it has to do with consistency and reliability and also basing it off of science. Now, obviously, does that mean that black cohosh that isn't standardized isn't going to be effective? Absolutely not. Um, does that mean though that some standardized extracts don't work as regular tinctures? Yes. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, there's gonna be another post uh, <clears throat> on the channel about ginkgo where I dig into this a little bit more, but actually ginkgo is technically not super effective um, when it's just ginkgo leaf, when it's just prepared as a regular tincture. Like all the research on it has been on the standardized extract. Now also within this category, I tend to think of, I also tend to think of what I call them like super concentrates. So in herbal medicine, right, you have your standard tinctures, which are usually like you know, for dried herbs, like one to five ratio, right? You're getting uh, per milliliter uh, or per, you're getting a gram of herb per five milliliter of tincture, right? That's where you see like one to five, one to two, one to three, right? It's how many grams of herb per milliliter of extract that you're taking. Then we get up to what's called a fluid extract, um, which I don't know why it has a different word, but a fluid extract is a one-to-one. -one. So for every, you're getting one gram of herb per milliliter of tincture. Once we get beyond fluid extract, 
This is where we get into what I tend to think of as the super concentrates, right? Which are gonna be, you know, anything beyond one to one. So two to one, five to one, 10 to one, 20 to one, 50 to one, right? So you're getting per mil, you know, you get 50, 50 grams of herb per one milliliter or whatever of tincture. I tend to think of that type of extract kind of in this general category of standardized extracts. Technically, I guess technically it's not standardized. Like the technical definition of a standardized extract is that it's a whole plant extract standardized to a certain percentage of certain uh, a certain compound or a certain class of compounds in that plant that typically has been well researched um, for having a particular medicinal benefit. So I like to think of these super concentrates as kind of being in this category. We see this a lot with like um, uh, many adaptogens are commonly super concentrated. We see these in sometimes solid extracts of plants. Eleuthero, or what is, used to be called Siberian ginseng, Eleutherococcus centicosis, very commonly done in a super concentrate. We see this in things like hawthorn solid extract, blueberry solid extract. Um, some of the, even the more just kind of food based herbs, you know, herbs that kind of are on that edge between food and medicine that are gonna maybe have a little greater activity <clears throat> the more concentrated it is, might be in this category as well. But it is really common to see sometimes just these really, really over the top concentrated extracts of certain herbs. And is it really necessary? I mean, sometimes yes, like if we're talking about ginkgo, then yeah, if you're going for all the stuff that ginkgo is well documented for, you kind of have to work with the standardized or super concentrated extracts. But for many medicinal plants, that's, it's just overkill. It's just not necessary. Your typical one to five ratio tincture or even one to two, one to three ratio tincture is typically more than enough to get all of the medicinal benefits of that herb. Now, there's another kind of maybe less common way of this type of extract, which would be rather than spiking the extract with a certain amount of a certain constituent. There's also ways of removing certain constituents from extracts. Uh, specifically, we see this done with herbs that might have some toxic compounds in them. And the big one here that we see is um, pyrolizidine alkaloids. So uh, for example, there are some comfrey extracts. I don't think you can get them in the United States anymore, but I know in Europe there are some, you know, PA-free comfrey extracts. I'm not sure if it's still available, but you know, butterbur or pedicides is an herb that uh, commonly in the supplement industry kind of pr talked about for migraines and things like that. Pedicides have very high amounts of pretty toxic pyrolizidine alkaloids. Obviously, any pedicides extracts that were available had the the those alkaloids removed, so rending, rendering them a little bit more safe. Another form of extract that we see with this is that what's called DGL, deglycerin, I can never say it, deglycerizinated licorice. Uh, glycerizin is <clears throat> a constituent in licorice that uh, can um, raise blood pressure, basically. Uh, so oftentimes, that DGL will be given to people that maybe have a greater risk for high blood pressure and maybe they want to work with licorice but they don't want to put themselves at risk for that elevated blood pressure so they work with that deglycerizinated or DGL licorice. So these can be useful, right? I think standardized extracts can be useful. Personally, I don't really use them myself very much um, and it's very rare that I recommend them to people just because they can get really expensive um, and that therefore affecting accessibility for people. And honestly, I just feel like sometimes it's not totally necessary uh, for people to be getting these huge rip roaring doses of herbs where <clears throat> uh, you know a, a milder extract is more than sufficient. And then the last class is the phytopharmaceuticals. And these are basically, you know, isolating 
singular compounds or complexes of compounds uh, in it from plants and giving them more in isolated form. So essentially with the, the phytopharmaceuticals, we're, you know, it's, I say it's about as close to a drug as you can get um, in terms of plant extracts. We're taking a part and separating it from the whole. And, you know, like things like curcumin extracts would fall under this category. Uh, boswellic acid, for example, from um, Boswellia or frankincense. Um, we see uh, these days, the big one is all the CBD extracts from cannabis and all that whole world of things. Uh, resveratrol extracted from Japanese knotweed, silymarin extracted from milk thistle, um, which again, silymarin or silymarin, I hear different people say it different ways. Uh, that, that's not really a singular constituent. It's more a whole spectrum of flavolignins um, that we get from milk thistle that uh, have been studied the most for their hepatoprotective capacity. And that's where, you know, some of these phytopharmaceuticals are really profound. I mean, the flav the silymarin from milk thistle, this is so powerful, it literally saves people's lives from eating things like death cap mushrooms, which kill you, right? I mean, you eat those mushrooms, you are going likely to die. <laughs> and uh, modern medicine doesn't really have much of anything that can do for that from my understanding, whereas uh, silymarin as an extract from milk thistle can literally save lives. Typically it's delivered as an injectable in an injectable form. So uh, I, I don't know how much milk thistle tincture <clears throat> you'd have to take in order to um, get that level of dosage of silymarin to be effective. I'm not sure how possible that is. I haven't really done the math to think it through, but um, these are very, very powerful. These are, um, you know, I do think some of the phytopharmaceuticals may have applications, um, but again, this is not something that I personally use very much. Most clinical herbalists I know don't really use them very much. I find where the kind of class of people that use herbs in the medical world do is would be more of like naturopaths. I find the naturopaths tend to be a lot more savvy in terms of the supplement industry, what types of products are available using kind of uh, more concentrated extracts from big companies and things like that um, that will be used a little bit more. But does that necessarily mean they're better? Like if we have someone that needs some general liver support and some hepatoprotection, uh, is giving them silymarin necessarily going to be better than giving them a whole plant extract of milk thistle? Uh, if someone needs antioxidant protection and they need some resveratrol, um, is just taking straight resveratrol going to be any better than taking a Japanese knotweed extract? Um, I'm not totally sure. I think there's different applications and different scenarios for these different types of extract. But in general, is like the question is, is stronger better? Is more concentrated better? Um, is there potential downsides of using plant isolates? Well, I think the absorption issue becomes a big, a big consideration here, like the curcumin example. I think that there, this concept of whole plant synergy is very important because like I said, it's very difficult for science to be able to 100% break down, dissect, and analyze everything that's going on within the human body when we take a whole plant extract. And when we separate apart from the whole, it functions differently. It's just things don't work the same when we take a part out of a whole. Uh, the whole system uh, doesn't work. I mean, we see this ecologically, right? You take a keystone species out of an environment and the whole ecosystem changes, right? To the point of sometimes it can cause ecosystem degradation. I mean, I don't want to say collapse, but the potential is there. Um, this is kind of the things that we run into when we start, start using these plant isolates 
And I think there's question in regards to, do they work better than the whole plant? Do they work worse than the whole plant? Is there any real benefit to it? Um, I think that that the the from my perspective, that the whole plant extract is, in my opinion, superior. I think that there may be places for certain standardized extracts like ginkgo, um, which is where all the research has been. Um, but maybe potentially for more very severe disease or where we need stronger interventions for people, like they need something to work now. Um, that's maybe where these more standardized or phy phytopharmaceutical based extracts might be applicable. But I think for the most part, for general health maintenance, for disease prevention, for treatment of a lot of just the standard stuff that we tend to face as herbalists, I personally feel like sticking with the classic forms of herbal preparation is is a good way to go. And you know, I, I'm talking about this because I've, I've had some questions come up recently among students where there was doubt. They started experiencing doubt in their medicine because they're hearing about, oh, well, there's these other extracts of that plant that are so much stronger and there's all this research on them. And, oh, is, am I giving my clients mediocre medicine? Is it good enough? Is it gonna work? And I think if you are really, if you're, especially if you're making your own medicine, if you're following, you know, the, the biochemical profile of the plant, and the solubility of those constituents when you're preparing, say, your tinctures, if you are making your own capsules and you're using relatively freshly dried herbs that haven't, you know, you're not using a five-year-old powder that's just been sitting on a shelf in the sunlight and getting really hot, you know, your medicine is going to be effective. Um, I feel like the standardization of herbal medicine is this scientific science's way of trying to keep it consistent and trying to keep it reliable. But I think in that process, something is lost. I think when we separate apart from the whole, we lose that vital intelligence of the plant, the way that that plant grows in nature, the way that that plant was shaped by its ecosystem the stressors that it experienced, all the plethora of secondary metabolites that that plant manufactured in response to that stress, not to mention the vital spirit of that herb, the intelligence of that herb, the soul, the consciousness of that herb. I think when we separate apart from the whole, we start to separate those parts out as well. And I think our medicine starts to lose something and it really is in a way, an application of that pharmaceutical model that I think a lot of us are kind of trying to get away from, right? Of course, pharmaceuticals have their place. I think every kind of medicine has its place, but there's a mindset with these kind of more scientifically based extracts uh, where we are separating apart from the whole and we're not putting those parts back together, right? And that's something that is what makes alchemical preparation so interesting and profound is that they we separate them, but we recombine them. Science just separates and separates and separates and divides, 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 and ad infinitum, but there's no recombination. There's no reassembly back into wholeness. And I think if we wanna treat the whole person, we have to use a whole medicine. We have to use a holistic extract. And to me, uh, th these more scientifically based forms of extracts of herbal medicines are, it's like another way where we're trying to outsmart nature, where we think we can do a better job than nature does. And I think that's where we kind of start to run into risks of creating other potential problems by tinkering with something that, in my personal opinion, is already perfect. It's already there's already a perfection there in the way that that plant was created or evolved, the way it grew, the way its shape is, the way its chemistry, its taste, its smell, everything about it 
It's good the way it is. And we just make a medicine that preserves that wholeness, that encapsulates the wholeness of that herb so that it can heal the wholeness of the person. So it's just a little bit of a breakdown of some different forms of extract um, that I wanted to share about there. Was, yeah, like I said, there's just a couple questions that came through uh, in the last couple weeks that I thought would be interesting to share my answers to it to the greater herbal community. So hopefully you found this interesting and illuminating and I truly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to make it this far into the video. It really does help support the channel much more than you might realize. Other ways that you can help is just by hitting the like button, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment, leave a review on the podcast. It really does help support the work that we do here at the School of Evolutionary Herbalism in a really, really big way. If you're watching or listening anywhere other than our website, be sure to head on over to evolutionaryherbalism.com where we've got tons of more resources and free training and all sorts of good stuff over there to help support you on your plant path. So I'm Sage Popham. Thanks so much for joining me in this video today. And until the next one, take care and be well.